Last time, we really dug into the electronic pull-down mechanism for the rear hatch, and we did eventually get it working, but that's not the last of the work that needs to be done. One of the more pressing concerns is the amount of water entering the car when it rains. I left it out through a few light showers and hadn't really noticed anything, but as soon as something a little bit heavier started coming down, the leaks were pretty apparent. First, there's some minor leakage through the passenger door window. It seems to leak where it meets the body at the rear, where it meets the T-top at the top, and just kind of generally into the door. But the leak we're concerned with at the moment is at the top of the rear hatch. There was a significant leak somewhere, and a lot of water was coming in, pooling on top of this piece of trim, and pouring out into the rear seat. The only openings to the outside in that area are related to the hatch itself. First, of course, there's the rear hatch weather stripping. I'm not too sure if this has been replaced or not, but it kind of looks like it has been. The material itself is in good condition, although there's quite a gap at the rear right above that pull-down mechanism which would definitely go towards explaining some of the rust and corrosion that's happened back there. It's also possible that some of this roof leakage was dripping down the hatch and getting down into the mechanism at the back. We won't be doing any thorough leak testing in this video, but for the sake of the longevity of the car, we will have to address that in the future. For now, since the weather stripping at the top of the hatch appears to be in good shape and is making solid contact all the way across the piece of glass, we'll take a look at the other obvious place that water could be getting through in that area, and that is through the hatch hinges themselves. The hatch is attached to the body with two hinges, and each of those is attached through the body with two studs. These bolt holes seem like a likely enough pathway for water into the car, so we'll have a go at resealing them. We decided the best way to do that and make sure the surfaces were clean was to fully remove the hatch from the vehicle. To get started, the first thing we need to remove is the high mount brake light. The housing is held to a mounting pad on the hatch with just two small screws. With the hardware out of the way, we can slide the housing off of the mounting pad that's glued to the glass. Then we can remove the four screws holding that rear trim piece to the roof and pull it out of the way. Instead of properly disconnecting any wires, I just wedged the brake light housing in the passenger side headrest, which actually did a pretty decent job at holding that trim piece out of the way. Now we have a straight shot at the hardware that's securing the hatch hinges to the body. Before removing those, we want to make sure the hatch is ready to come off. We'll have a friend support the hatch so that we can remove the defroster wires and disconnect the hatch struts. Just like we showed when we installed these in episode 2, there's just one bolt at the top to remove, and then they can be slid off. Then I'll wedge myself into the back seat with the impact gun, and loosen the four fasteners. There is sealant goop on these, so the impact gun is a big help. The hatch is secured with four of these nuts, and once they've been removed, the thing is ready to lift off. Because of the size and weight of the assembly, I wouldn't even think about trying this alone. It would be pretty tragic to break this piece of glass and have to find another one. Between the glass, the deck lid, and the spoiler, the whole assembly weighs around 100 pounds. We actually used three pairs of hands to lift the hinges away from the body, then we were able to carry it away and set it on the ground. Very carefully, of course. And here's the back of the car without that rear hatch. It kind of has a bit of an El Camino thing going on there. There are three square holes and one round hole where the hatch mounts to the body. This means the left and right side hinges can only be installed one way. It also means there's no provision for adjustment of the mounting of the hatch on this side of the hinges. Each hinge has a gasket that seals against the body. These gaskets were pretty dried out and very stuck to the hinges. It took some work with a razor blade, then prying them loose with a screwdriver to get them off intact. We don't have replacements for these gaskets, so we'll have to cut our own, and separating one of them intact will make this easier. We repeated the same process with the driver's side hinge, and were able to get that gasket off mostly intact as well. And just like any other gasket surface, we'll remove remnants of the old gaskets and make the surface as clean as possible. We'll also use brake clean, a thread chaser, and a wire brush to clean off the studs. We'll do the same thing to clean up the washer surface as well as the thread on the nuts. We traced the old gaskets onto some generic gasket material and cut them out. Of course, we also cleaned up the hinge mating surfaces on the body of the car. We'll slide our new gaskets onto the hinge studs and carefully apply some RTV around the base of each of the studs. 
The gasket should seal to the body, but the RTV will provide a little bit extra sealing security. And once we've done that, the hatch is ready to be reinstalled. We'll carry it back over to the car, carefully line up those hinges, and drop it into place. Once the studs are through the roof, we'll coat the connection between the two with a bit more RTV, and thread the four nuts back into place. Once they've been started, we will very carefully snug them down. Once all four are up against the roof, we'll let them sit there for a minute or two so the RTV can skim over. In the meantime, we'll lift the hatch back up and reinstall the lift struts. We'll pop each side in place, tighten down the screw, and reattach the wire for the rear defrost. With all of that back together, we'll fully close the hatch using the electric pull-down. With it fully closed in its resting position, we'll tighten those four hatch bolts down to the body. We'll just use a ratchet to get them nice and tight. With the sealer on the threads, they shouldn't be coming loose anytime soon. Then we'll reattach the trim as well as the high mount stoplight. And just like that, the hatch hinges should be totally sealed where the studs pass through the body. And as long as that weather stripping isn't totally incompetent, we shouldn't have any more water coming through the roof. At least, not anywhere but around the T-tops, but that's pretty much factory. In a future episode, we'll be replacing all of the weather stripping, and we already have a kit to do it. Since resealing those hinges, the car hasn't undergone a huge amount of leak testing or driving through heavy rain, but I haven't noticed a single drop coming from that area or had wet rear seats. So hopefully, seemingly, that's one of the leaks taken care of. Again, obviously, that large gap at the rear of the hatch weather stripping isn't helping anything, but I think there's at least one other reason water is getting in at the rear of the hatch. If you take an up-close look at the car, it's hard not to notice this. The alignment of the rear hatch with the body line of the car is... well... bad. This is caused by those powerful lift struts pushing everything back over the years. For a better look at exactly how that happens, let's take another look at the 1984 Camaro that we mentioned in the last episode. This car was sitting in a parts yard and somebody had already removed the back glass. It seems like somebody just took the steel framing from around the glass because the steel spoiler lid was still there. Here is what that rear hatch glass looks like totally separated. These are the holes used to mount the hinges at the top end of the glass. These allow for a little bit of adjustment as the hole is about an eighth of an inch bigger than the bolt that passes through it. But the holes in the glass that the steel spoiler lid attached to are significantly larger. These are three quarters of an inch larger than the bolts that pass through them, which means there is a lot of potential for adjustment there. And all that space for adjustment is exactly what allows that spoiler lid to slide rearwards on the glass over the years. Here's the underside of that steel lid. It's just four quarter inch bolts and some weather seal glue holding it to the glass. On our Firebird, it seems likely that both of these points of adjustment have been pushed fully rearward by the lift struts. But I really don't feel like removing, cleaning, and resealing the spoiler lid. So even though it is likely part of the problem, for now we won't be adjusting that but we can do at least a little bit of adjustment at the forward hinge bolts much more easily. The first thing we'll try is just loosening up the glass, muscling it forward, and then tightening it down again. The glass is held to the hinges with four bolts and four nuts. By lifting the hatch up, we can access the four nuts on the underside of those hinges. Then we'll, once again, remove the lift struts, and with somebody holding the hatch up, we can see exactly how much room for adjustment there is. As we saw in that other piece of glass, there's a little bit of room there, but not a heck of a lot. It's worth a try to push it forward though, and hopefully this can make some kind of a difference. With the hatch lifted up and held in that forward position, we went ahead and tightened the four nuts back down. These are kind of scary to tighten down since they are going through the glass. There's also not enough room to use anything but a combination wrench on them while the glass is mounted to the vehicle. I went ahead and got them as snug as I dared to, then we reinstalled the lift struts and closed the hatch. And immediately, the alignment was much better. The gap at the top end was a lot smaller than it had been, and while the alignment at the rear still wasn't great, it was a lot better. The driver's side is actually pretty much flush, but the passenger side still overhangs a little bit. The gaps between the hatch and the body on the sides are also passable. 
It seemed like this small adjustment was enough to make everything good enough that I was happy with it. And I was happy with it for two or three months until the hatch slid right back where it was. As we talked about, the problem is those lift struts are just too dang strong. I would like to get it adjusted again, but this time we'll have to try something else to get it to actually stay there. This time we'll go ahead and take a few measurements. With the glass presumably at its rearmost position, we've got 0.39 inches of clearance at the passenger side hinge. And at the same spot on the driver side hinge, it looks like we have around 0.45 inches of clearance. The glass to body gap on the driver side is about 0.12 inches, and it's about the same on the passenger side. The deck lid overhang at the passenger side is a full quarter of an inch. This is the worst side and the one we're more concerned about, and I guess I forgot to measure the driver side, so it's the number we're going to use for a comparison. We'll start the adjustment process just like we did the last time. We'll open the hatch up and loosen the four nuts that hold it to the hinges. Once all four of them are loose, we're going to completely remove the two on the passenger side. And we can pull the plastic capped bolts through the other side of the glass. Getting the second one out required a little bit of a forward push on the hatch, but nothing excessive. The glass still has a clear outline of where the bolt was mounted. The smaller shoulder on the plastic cap of the bolt is what locates and actually touches the glass. That shoulder measures at 0.44 inches, and the hole in the glass measures at 0.51 inches. That means there is a sixteenth of an inch of play there. All things considered, that is quite a small amount. Since there is so much more room for adjustment on the other end of the glass, it seems like the oversizing of these holes may have more been allowing for production tolerance than anything else. But since there is a little bit of adjustment there, and these are fairly easy to get to, we're going to use that sixteenth of an inch to our advantage. But how are we going to fix this? What fancy space age material can we use to fill that gap and take up all that slack? Well, uh, yeah, we're actually just going to use electrical tape again. We'll cut the tape into many thin strips and apply them to the plastic register on these bolts. Of course, since we're trying to push the glass all the way in one direction, we're putting all of this tape on one side of the bolt. And here is our finished stack of vinyl tape. These strips were a little bit too long, and I think I had to trim them once or twice to actually get the bolt reinstalled, but this is pretty much what the final product looked like. And as we can see, that part of the bolt is now the same diameter as the hole in the glass. The hole that the bolt passes through in the hinge is slotted. This allows for some side-to-side -side adjustment, and it holds onto the hex part of the bolt to keep it from rotating. That's how we're able to tighten down the bolt without holding anything on the other end, and it'll keep the vinyl electrical tape from being moved around. Before reinstalling the bolts, we're going to apply a little bit of RTV at the top of the glass. This isn't necessary for keeping water out of the car, because the bolt holes in the glass are on the outside of the weather stripping. But I figured it would keep water from getting in and maybe corroding the bolts, and help prolong our vinyl tape spacer. It could also help keep the bolts from sliding on the glass, so if you weren't using a spacer, this could be a good idea for that reason. Once we've let that sit there for a minute or two, we need to reinstall our bolts. We'll be installing these with the tape spacer side facing the front of the car. We have to be careful to make sure the tape stays in place and doesn't get pushed around when we're installing these bolts. Just like when removing them, we need to give a little bit of a push on the hatch to get the second bolt installed. And once they're both in place, we'll reinstall the nuts. For a little bit of extra security, we're using blue Loctite on each of these. That should help balance out the fear of not getting these tight enough to keep things from moving versus breaking the glass by getting them too tight. For now, we're leaving these just a little bit loose so that we still have a little bit of wiggle room for removing the other two bolts. We'll also go ahead and clean up the excess RTV so that everything looks fairly clean. And now we'll be repeating that same process on the driver's side. We'll finish loosening and then remove the nuts, and lift each of the bolts out of the top of the glass. These two needed a little bit more convincing, which may be because we have already installed the spacers on the other side. If we hadn't already tested and determined that a little bit of movement was possible on all four of these bolts, I might be a bit more weary of doing this because I could see a situation where we're forcing the glass into a constant state of tension by not having enough adjustment, and that would not be ideal. 
But since when they're loosened up just a little bit, everything moves freely, I'm pretty sure that when removing these, we're just fighting the lift struts and gravity, and we're not going to be putting the glass in a stressed state by installing our spacers. But either way, the holes in the glass weren't lining up very well with the slots in the hinges on the driver's side, and I think we're going to need a little bit of help here. I was going to have to loosen up the lift strut on the driver's side to get a little bit of wiggle room for installing the bolts. Unfortunately, I didn't have any friends that were free, and I needed someone to help hold up the hatch. So I... I think we're going to have to wake up an old friend. We'll go ahead and pop out the lift strut from the hatch and use the broomstick to support it. This way we don't have to fight with the lift strut and we can move the hatch around a little bit more easily to reinstall these bolts. Just like the other side, we'll clean up the glass and apply some RTV, build up our electrical tape spacers, and reinstall the two bolts. Having the broomstick supporting the glass and being able to move the whole thing around made it a lot easier. Then we'll hold down each of the bolts, reinstall the nuts, and snug them down. Again, we're being careful not to displace the vinyl tape. With both of those back in place, we'll relieve the broomstick of its duty and reinstall the hatch strut. And now that the hatch is resting the way it's supposed to, we'll finish tightening the glass down on the hinges. We could go with the torque spec of shatter the glass, then back off half a turn to make sure they're the right tightness, but instead we're just going to get them reasonably tight. And with those in place, we can finally close the hatch again and check the alignment. The roof gap at the passenger side hinge is 0.32 inches. At the driver side, we're looking at 0.35. The trunk lid gap on the passenger side is 0.14 inches, and on the driver side, it's around 0.12. But how about that overhang at the rear? On the passenger side, it's decreased to 0.18 inches. And on the driver's side, it's maybe a sixteenth of an inch, but it feels pretty close to flush. And unlike the first time we adjusted the hatch, it has now been two months, and it doesn't seem to have moved much. It may have settled a little bit, as the driver's side now reads 0.09 inches, and the passenger side 0.20. Which means we did all that to push the hatch forward around 0.05 inches, less than a sixteenth of an inch. I don't know, it looks a little bit better, I guess, and the weather stripping is a little bit more where it's supposed to be. If it were any farther off, we'd probably have to loosen that back deck lid and try to push it forward and straighten it out, just about in the same way we did the top hinge bolts. But at least for now, we're going to be calling that good enough. If we do end up working with this in the future, it'll probably be redoing the sealant so that it actually keeps water out the way it's supposed to but I'm not yet sure it is actually leaking, and I don't want to mess with it if it's not necessary. Speaking of unnecessary work, aren't you glad we keep our cars so nice and clean? As for our magnificent, slightly demonic helper, I think this time we're going to let him stick around. Now that he's undead, he's tireless anyway. And we're getting towards the end of this video, but there is one more thing to cover. In the last episode, we mentioned how concerningly hard the latch closes and opens, and I'm pretty sure if we leave it alone, it will eventually break something. It also means that the electronic release solenoid has a lot of trouble popping the hatch. Without the engine running, it takes three to five presses to pop the hatch up most of the time. And I'm pretty sure this is because the hatch is pulling down farther than it's supposed to. So far, in fact, that it's bending the steel bracket that the gearbox attaches to. Just look at how much bounce and movement there is when the hatch is released. That is a lot of extra stress being put on the plastic gearbox. So how can we adjust this amount of tension on the hatch? Well, actually, this one is pretty easy. The entirety of the hatch pull-down mechanism is held to the body with three bolts. If we loosen these bolts and remove one of them, we can see that there is a lot of room for adjustment there. We have around 3 eighths of an inch of adjustment at each bolt. We'll reinstall that bolt and figure out where we want our hatch pulldown to be. For the first test, we'll line up everything the way it looks like it was previously mounted and slide the bracket up just a little bit from there. 
Then we'll tighten down the three bolts in that new position and give it a try. And it immediately looks a lot better. The gearbox is still flexing the mounting bracket a little bit, but the release is much less violent. I tried a few different positions, raising the pull down up a little bit or down a little bit, but that first adjustment is pretty close to the final one. My best guess is that this whole pull down was loosened at some point and tightened back down in its bottom most position. Even before I loosened the bolts, the whole thing was as far down as it would go. When I was doing the guessing and checking adjustment, I looked for the highest mounting position it could be at for the softest pull down and release that still pulled the hatch down hard enough that I couldn't move it at all when it was in the closed position. And that's what we're looking at here. This was the final adjusted position. In this position, with a fully charged battery, the hatch will just about always open with one press of the button on the dashboard. With the engine running, it seems like the solenoid will work the first time, every time. This final position had us raise it about a sixteenth of an inch on the driver's side and maybe three thirty-seconds of an inch on the passenger side. So in this case, that small of an adjustment made all the difference. Watching it in slow motion, the pull-down still bounces a little bit when it's released, but I think I have to say that that's as good as it's going to get. Any higher than that and the hatch doesn't seem like it's closing fully and you can still wiggle it even when it's latched. This could even help seal the hatch once we replace the weather stripping. As it was, the seal in the back was getting pretty crushed when the hatch was closed. Once we install a new non-flattened seal, we might actually have to adjust this again. But we'll deal with that when we get there. In the name of trying to include as much information in this video as possible, there is yet another adjustment for the position of the hatch. Just like for the hood of a car, this hatch has rubber bumpers that push down against the body. These are meant to be adjustable and can be threaded in and out. I say meant to be because on my car they're a little busted and should probably be replaced. But for now, I think we're well within good enough territory and the hatch seems to be working the way it's supposed to. We did end up replacing the relay that we diagnosed as being bad in the previous episode, and with that, the system seems to be working as close to perfect as I could reasonably expect. There were some comments on the previous video about the surface finish of the pull-down mechanism, and right now I'm not entirely sure the extent to which I want to deal with this, but I should probably do something about it. So sometime in the future, before we put the trim back in the car, that is something we should address. For now though, this two episode long hatch odyssey is, well, as complete as it's going to be for now. So thanks for watching, hopefully this has been informative if not at least a little bit interesting, but if I have to talk about hatch pulldowns or latch switches or position adjustment or lift struts one more time, I'm gonna...